thank you for joining us in this virtual town hall meeting with Foundation for Economic Education, better known as FI. My name is Jelivina Shelianos, but you can call me Z for short, and I'm a not-so-new president of uh, Foundation for Economic Education. Thank you for joining us today. I think we have, have, we're going to have an excellent hour uh, discussing many issues uh, that I think many of you are holding dear. Uh, we have over 1,000 people registered for this event, uh, so we're going to give you a couple of minutes to, to join in. Uh, in, the mean, in the meantime, feel free to begin submitting any questions you have using Zoom's question and answer feature. If you if you look through your Zoom account or through your Zoom window, there is a Q&A uh, to submit your questions and we're gonna try and answer them, uh, uh, them later. Now, I know this is, these are tough times. Uh, Fee is also working uh, from home. Uh, we're sort of sheltering in place a bit. Uh, and the fact that you actually devoted some time of joining us, uh, I think uh, I, I, thank you, I thank you so much for that. And I think we can, we can make it worth your while while discussing these topics. So first things we're gonna discuss or we're gonna sort of look into is whether there are bureaucratic uh, obstacles to actually people doing their jobs. If there are bureaucratic obstacles to people producing hand sanitizer or delivering food and things like that. So one topic we wanna discuss there is actually government helping or hurting uh, in this pandemic. And at least I think we're gonna concentrate on, on, on substances or matters or instances where in fact government is not, uh, is not healthy, helping. Second thing we're going to look into, I think, is uh, some sort of uh, licensing laws and school choice. I mean, well, if we're talking school choice, many of us are pretty much homeschoolers right now. So if this works during the crisis, why can it not work during, uh, during normal times? Uh, I think that the thing that we really want to touch upon is how we as a movement, how we as think tank leaders can come out of this situation better than, we, than it began. Meaning, I think what we'll see uh, that this crisis or this pandemic has definitely highlighted that there are some useless regulations that actually are not helping anyone. So, you know, can we seize the momentum? How, can we seize the day and actually run with these reforms so those can be implemented after this crisis is over? And also, I, the thing I want to touch about is a frank conversation about individuals' constitutional rights. On one hand, we do understand that it does kind of make sense not to go to bars and restaurants during a pandemic. In the same time, can, uh, does the government really have the authority to stop people and, uh, inquire, and inquire them where they're going and what exactly they're doing? As I think it happened in many cases, people being stopped in the street or in their car and having to give a good explanation of why they are outside. So isn't this an overstep uh, uh, from, uh, uh, on the part of the government? So like I said, uh, utilize the Q&A function and uh, our panelists will be able to answer your, your questions. And now moving into panelists, we have excellent speakers to join us today. Let me introduce them briefly. So first one, we have Daniel Rothschild. He's a executive director of the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Daniel's background is policy, communications, program management, and many, many more interesting things. Uh, then we have Kent Lassman, president and CEO of Competitive Enterprise Institute, another Washington-based group. Uh, Kent oversees strategy for CI, management, uh, policy, communications, and fundraising. So basically, Kent, Kent does everything at CI. Another person we have is Corey DeAngelis, who is a director of School Choice at Reason Foundation, and he's also an adjunct scholar at the Cato's Institute Center for Educational Freedom. Corey's research primarily focuses on the effects of school choice programs, criminal activity, character skills, mental health, and political participation. And finally, we have Christina Sandifer, who is an executive vice president at Goldwater Institute. Christina develops policies, litigates cases, advances healthcare, freedom, free enterprise, property rights, free speech, and taxpayer rights, basically all the things I like. Uh, Christina is a co-drafter of the Right to Try initiative, uh, and that actually that initiative was adopted by 41 states and later signed in by President Trump. So let us begin our, our, our panel, and let me begin with Christina Sandifer. Uh, Christina, you are a, an expert in Right to Try for years now. Uh, we are seeing red tape being stripped away and the FDA approving trials for different drugs at a record pace. Could you provide some insight of what exactly is going on and what does this mean for the future? And can we as a liberty movement uh, uh, take an advantage of this uh, right to try ideas and policies? Christina? Yes, well, thank you, Z, uh, for having me. Thanks to Fee. Uh, and this is some really excellent questions. You know, for decades, the FDA's sort of bureaucratic drug approval process has really stopped patients from accessing 
potentially life-saving treatments. And, you know, sadly, we're even seeing some of the remnants of that red tape of the past affecting our future and affecting our ability to deal with this crisis. We can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A, but we've seen CDC and FDA rules that have made it difficult for people to get tested to determine where they have the virus. Um, hand sanitizer was mentioned. Um, we've uh, seen that rules make it difficult for people to produce their own hand sanitizer. So those remnants are definitely still there. But the exciting thing about Right to Try is that, you know, we at the Goldwater Institute designed it for times like these, and we worked with doctors and patients, uh, and many of you across the country to get it passed for times like these to establish that patients, especially those whose lives hang in the balance, have the right to try treatments that might not be fully government approved. They might not have the government stamp of approval, um, but you know, they're things that doctors think might be able to help them when all of their options are lost. Uh, and really the right to try in, in terms of this crisis has given the FDA a new mandate to meet immediate needs of patients that are facing these life-threatening challenges, especially in light of the current crisis. And we're seeing that sort of that right to try spirit really pervade a lot of what is going on at the federal level and how the FDA is dealing with this crisis. Um, federal agencies are finally expanding approval for diagnostic tests and labs. Uh, the FDA just recently granted emergency authorization uh, for a treatment called chloroquine. We can talk about that some more later too. That is a treatment that is FDA approved for certain, treat, uh, certain diseases, um, not for COVID-19, but there's some indication there might be some promise there. So the FDA granted an emergency authorization to make that treatment available from the strategic national stockpile to help patients um, for whom it might be helpful. The FDA just announced days ago that uh, a new accelerated program, this is really exciting, uh, to help expedite the clinical evaluation of any potential vaccine or treatment that might be helpful in this crisis and a pre-approval process to help patients get access to those treatments. And of course, because Right to Try protects the right of terminally ill patients or patients who are very sick to try unapproved treatments that their doctors think might help them, um, patients are gonna have more options to try those treatments than ever before. So I think Right to Try has really changed the way that we think about what role the government should and frankly should not play uh, in situations like this and whether a patient should have access to life-saving treatment. And really the current crisis demonstrates this new mindset, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. This is an unprecedented situation, um, but we have unprecedented opportunity to leverage here to further break down regulatory barriers and make sure that some of these good um, deregulatory moves remain permanent, not just to help patients through this crisis, but also in the future. So a couple of those things that I think Liberty Allies should be working on is uh, expanding right to try to make it available to people who um, want to try personalized treatments that are custom designed for individual patients. This is truly the wave of the future and Right to Try should apply to those treatments as well. Um, facilitating international drug reciprocity, right? There are countries outside of the United States that have important scientific information that we should be harnessing here in the United States uh, to help us approve treatments quicker and faster so that drugs don't have to go through multiple approval processes um, before they can get to patients. Uh, removing uh, the FDA's gag rule that actually keeps doctors from learning uh, about critical treatment um, and getting critical treatment information uh, about treatments that could help patients. Um, there's been a lot of talk, and again, we can go over it in the Q&A, but you've probably heard a lot of talk about off-label treatments these past couple of weeks. These are treatments that are already approved by the FDA for one purpose or one patient population, and it's perfectly legal for doctors using their medical judgment to use those approved treatments to treat other possible um, ailments, including, of course, COVID-19. But there are federal restrictions on how medical professionals can communicate this important information and whether or not these treatments might work and how they might work. We need to remove that FDA gag rule, and we have plans to do that and then, of course, there are a number of state barriers to treatment um, that should be removed. 
um, across across state borders, uh, getting rid of certificate of need laws that require uh, medical professionals to get permission, not just from government, but from their competitors before they offer healthcare services and expand healthcare facilities. These are arcane rules that have really limited our ability to respond in this crisis. We see some states now stepping up to remove those. Those rules should be permanent. Um, allowing medical professionals licensed in one state to practice in another state. Don't forget how to be a doctor or a nurse just because you move across state lines and that'll really help with the doctor and medical professional shortages and then promoting things like telemedicine and other other innovations in the healthcare field so really again these are unprecedented times they're scary times make no mistake about that but our freedom movement really has an unprecedented opportunity to move closer to what we all want to see what what our goal is in healthcare and that is making sure that government gets out of the way so that patients that we're getting the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. Christina, if I may, very quickly, would you say among the politicians, obviously you don't need, you don't need to convince me or the, probably the people here that, you know, right to try is great, but has the political thinking shifted already? I think it really has. Um, not perhaps as quickly as we would like it to. Uh, bureaucratic inertia has a, has a funny way of sticking. Um, and of course, the FDA is a massive bureaucracy that's been around for a very, very long time, and it's become less and less patient-centric. But I think Right to Try um, has really brought to the forefront, again, this idea that doctors and medical professionals and patients should be the ones to be able to make these decisions. And you see Right to Try being discussed almost on an hourly basis now among politicians and bureaucrats in a way that we just never heard before. Um, and I think that is really promising for how we're going to see bureaucracies deal with this crisis, but also the accountability that the public is going to, to hold these bureaucracies to because they know that they have this right and they're going to demand it. Okay, thank you, Christina, for these insights. It's so great that we have Goldwater, who is actually doing this fantastic work in this time. Let me move to Cora DeAngelis. And like I already kind of announced earlier, we are all... Uh, we all homeschoolers now, Corey, right? So my question to be, do you think, uh, or how much will this crisis have an impact in, in actually shifting people or even policies towards more school choice, more homeschooling, or even different types of schooling? Uh, so basically what I'm trying to say is, is this crisis helping with school choice and homeschooling? Hey, thanks, Z. Thanks for having me in this conversation. I think you're absolutely right that we're essentially all homeschoolers now. It depends on how you define homeschooling and uh, the the particulars of what homeschooling you know looks like in 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 another you know type of scenario. But essentially, in the United States, just a few weeks ago, the only about three percent of the school age population was classified as homeschoolers. Now, essentially, a hundred percent of the school age population can be in my in in my view, classified as a homeschooler, I will say that homeschool groups, though, will argue with me about this, and they'll say that well, homeschooling in in the perfect scenario would look a lot different, right? Like they would like to call this government schooling from home, which is a little different from what homeschooling would actually look like in a different world where people were able to, uh, you know, homeschool out of their own free will. This was essentially not, uh, you know. Uh, not a voluntary move. You know, people were essentially forced from their brick and mortar schools to a home-like environment. But whatever you want to call it, a lot of people are being educated at home right now or schooled from home right now. And what I see as a result of that will be that homeschooling, the, pr the proportion of homeschoolers in the United States will increase probably in, in the short run and hopefully in the long run as well, because a lot of people will figure out that, look, I can actually educate my children at home or they'll see that there's a lot of benefits to educating their children at home. Um, you know, the kids can learn a lot more in a lot less time. They don't have to go through all the transportation to getting to school. They don't have to uh, deal with all the administrative stuff going on in the, in the brick and mortar schools. And the kids may enjoy self-directed learning a lot more. And, they, and then obviously the parents could figure out that a lot of these kids aren't, uh, you know, getting bullied as much as they were when they were around their peers at school. So there's a lot of benefits to homeschooling that families could figure out. And in theory, it should only be an upward pressure on that percentage of school of homeschoolers going forward, because although a lot of people will experience this and say, oh, I mean, if this is what homeschooling looks like, I don't want any part of it. People, there, there will be people who say that, but those people weren't homeschooling anyway. So we should only expect the homeschool proportion to go up 
if you ask for my prediction, I don't know how much it's going to go up. Uh, but even if it only goes up by one percentage point, that's a large relative increase. That would be a 33% increase. Um, so that, that's still a meaningful difference in homeschooling going forward. And we also may see an increase in virtual education. Uh, there are a lot of charter, virtual charter schools in the United States right now that were essentially uninterrupted uh, from COVID-19, except for particular states actually blocked students from leaving their district or their government run brick and mortar schools to go to cyber charter schools or virtual charter schools. Uh, so there were you know, states that had their unions pushing against allowing students to leave their brick and mortar government schools to enroll in virtual charter schools. So I think advocates of school choice need to point this stuff out that there's a lot of you know, dirty things going on in particular states. For example, in Oregon, um, in Oregon, they actually made it illegal to switch to these uh, virtual charter schools uh, starting on March 27th, which was uh, not too long ago. And one virtual charter school in Oregon actually reported to the, to the uh, Wall Street Journal that just their school alone, Oregon Connections Academy, had about 1,600 students blocked from being able to be served at their school because the unions and other groups, special interest groups, were pushing to not allow students to get that kind of virtual education that they needed in this particular crisis. So I think we need to point out the bad things that are going on in particular states like that. For example, also in, in Alaska, they actually did a good thing. They allowed a new virtual school to open and it's in concert with a Florida virtual school. And the teachers union came out, came out hard against it in Alaska and argued um, that Alaska shouldn't have done this, that it could be stealing jobs from them. Um, but Alaska still went ahead and did it and partnered with Florida Virtual School and still went against the special interest group and uh, you know, provided another virtual uh, you know, option for their students. So I think that's a good move in that state. Uh, but also, you know, uh, I've predicted that homeschooling should go up in the coming years. I don't know how much, but I think another barrier to be able to educate your children from home has to do with finances. So even a lot of, if a lot of families say, oh, I really like this, you know, my kid's not getting bullied, they're learning a lot more, they're learning in a much, at a much quicker rate, they may not be able to do so financially. So that's where school choice comes into play, uh, in particular education savings accounts. This is the premier form of school choice, the best form of school choice in my view. It's kind of like a voucher where you opt out of your government run school and some of that funding follows you to a private school of choice. But instead of limiting families to only be able to spend that money at a brick and mortar school or a, or a virtual school, the money goes into a savings account for that child that can only be used for government approved education expenditures, including homeschooling expenditures. So I think that's also needed, not just the desire to homeschool, but also the financial means to do so through the education savings account mechanism. So I think this could lead to more education savings accounts in the future because the families that really want homeschooling as a result of this could say, well, why don't we have ESAs? These five other states have education savings accounts. Um, so there could be a push for education savings accounts. And I think a good way to do it is to allow those families to take maybe even just 80% of the funding they would have gotten in the government run schools. In the United States today, the latest numbers say that we spend $15,424 per child in the government run schools. Why not let families take $12,000, save the taxpayers 22%, save the government run schools some money as well, and then also benefit the families by allowing them to take $12,000 to the school of their choice? I mean, obviously, this would differ by from state to state, but that's the national average. Um, so I think it's really important, again, to highlight that you know, homeschooling families need to be able to do this financially. We're already spending, uh, you know, public dollars on these students. Um, why not allow that money to go to the families instead of to the institutions? The money should follow the child, not the, not the system. And then also, I, I see that this could lead to more uh, virtual education if states and governments don't prevent families from switching sectors. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Corey. I think you have some dangerous ideas on your mind. Money following a child and not an institution. I mean, what kind of world do you think we're going to live in if money follows the actual student or the actual family? I mean, jokes aside, I just, I'll just add another joke. I mean, I really care about education, and I, I, I used to be a teacher, 
uh, my previous think tank, we used to do a lot of things in education. But my first experience of school choice actually came in Soviet Union. I was born and raised in Soviet Union, and in Soviet Union we had school choice, which means even in a planned economy you could choose actually what school to go to, and, and schools specialize in different things. So even in that system where everything was the same, exactly the same uniforms for 180 million people, there was still school choice. So when people say that somehow school choice is uber capitalist or uh, uh, sort of taking apart the, 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 the schooling system, that's complete, that's complete nonsense. It's actually giving a person a choice. Yeah, we'll, we'll, talk, about, we'll talk about some of these points in the uh, in a Q&A. We have to move on. We have Kent. Now, I met Kent a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I met him earlier, but a couple of weeks ago, we had an excellent webinar in, in, in which he talks about the Never Needed Initiative. And I think one, one thing is like, that's an awesome hashtag. Second thing, I think CEI is really good at, at sort of showing or highlighting the really useless, edu uh, useless regulation. I think you guys are one of the best uh, in the US in doing that. I mean, your whole 10,000 commandments and all that. Uh, awesome, awesome resources. So Kent, how do you see this kind of situation? Will, we, will this help our deregulation efforts? Or in fact, we're gonna end up even with more regulation? So that, that uh, question Z is pregnant. There's a lot of a lot of potential with that. So let me let me start by saying uh, I take very seriously such a high compliment coming from uh, you and the fee community because this is this is a group of people that definitely understand the weight of regulation in our lives, and this is something uh, that I that I actually want to lead with and illustrate for everyone. Perhaps one of the silver linings of the situation we find ourselves in is that all across the country, and uh, I would argue also across the world, is a growing appreciation of what heretofore is hidden. People don't see the effects of regulation. It's the uh, probably the worst application of Basiat's lesson about the seen and the unseen. <laughs> And all across the economy, there is hidden frictions into making decisions about how we're going to relate with others. Um, Christina and Corey have given wonderful examples of where it shows up in very important and urgent areas right now, uh, in our health services, in the development of testing and medical device, um, decisions about care, what drugs or therapies and protocols to follow, certainly in education. And what has come out of the last month or month and a half is a great, greater appreciation that there are regulations throughout the economy that were probably never needed. And that's the genesis of the hashtag that you referenced. Uh, our, our thinking on the response to what's happening, uh, I organize into three basic uh, categories or categories of activity. There are problems that are slowing down an effective response. And those regulatory barriers, uh, they exist uh, in different areas. They have slowed down our response in transportation. They've slowed down our response, certainly in healthcare and testing. There's been um, ample documentation of the problems at the CDC and FDA of getting effective testing out in the, the weeks that were lost in early February in March. The second category of activity that we need to focus our policy minds around and our policy advocacy around is in areas of resilience. What is it that we need to do or be aware of from a policy question that helps Americans respond better to the situation in which they find themselves? And those fundamental questions of resilience include uh, like what Christina was talking about. There will be questions about treatment that deal with resilience because of uh, health systems at capacity or approaching capacity. And then the third category we haven't quite uh, found ourselves living in, but I think is important to be thinking about now and we're, we're doing our uh, level best to get prepared for. And those are the policy questions and responses that we should have that allow the economy and activity within our lives to reboot and get started after such stark and dramatic uh, uh, freezes on activity. So 
Um, let me give a couple examples from each and, and then I'll just wrap because I think the framework is as important as any of the specific examples. The framework is what we need in order to make the calculus. How do we go forward and change the laws or change the regulations so that we're having an effective response today that we're resilient and able to adapt to the situation that is uh, right in front of us. And then third, uh, soon to be extremely important, what is it we can do to put in the best conditions to allow uh, uh, tens of millions of people to either re-enter or ramp their way back into the workforce after sustained uh, uh, break from the workforce and um, get businesses either reopened or at least partially reopened when uh, conditions allow for that. Um, so very briefly, in that first category, um, uh, we saw uh, largely led by governors, uh, tremendous executive authority exerted in order to suspend or repeal regulations uh, basically everywhere that they could find them. Um, we saw this in childcare, in education. I mentioned transportation and the delivery of goods. Uh, we see this in hours of service for different types of businesses. And we have seen it in the delivery of health services, the telemedicine, the certificate of need, the barriers or restrictions on getting into, the, uh, into society with a service that's urgently needed. Those barriers uh, were suspended or lifted uh, quite radically and quickly by governors all across the board. In the category of resilience, this is, um, uh, again, what you referenced with our, our Never Needed project. Uh, we'll be following uh, a wonderful paper that I saw out of Mercatus about 10 days ago, I think it was. We have a, a compendium coming out tomorrow. There's a very active hashtag but just a documentation married to, uh, documentation of those things that have been suspended, married to recommendations of where lawmakers and regulators can turn tomorrow, uh, very concrete steps that they can take to f ease the burden on uh, American life today, given where we are with the, um, with the pandemic. Um, and then third, the, the efforts to reboot the economy. Um, I think we'll see a lot of activity there in employment law. Um, you know, there's been discussion, uh, not new to the uh, B community of a law in California called AB5, which was a very dramatic uh, touchstone for discussion around the difference between an employee and a contractor and the way we treat them under the law, the requirements that are uh, expected of, of uh, employers. Going forward, those sorts of questions about how do we put people in the workforce? How do we give them the flexibility so that they can be adaptive with uh, whatever employer or service provider that is out there and able to hire them uh, so that they can do so, even if it doesn't look like uh, the standard definition of the Department of Labor that was given to us in the 1950s, uh, courtesy of the labor movement. Um, those sorts of reboot regulatory activities um, we will see come this autumn in education, I believe. Uh, we will see them in an ongoing fashion with banking and finance, and certainly labor and employment law will be part of that story. Uh, and that's where we're devoting our 90 and 120 day um, perspective. That's, that's our horizon for policy development and recommendations at this point. All right. Thank, Thank you, Kent. And that's a perfect segue with Daniel Rothschild. Uh, what is the way forward? I mean, how do we reboot? How do we restart? How, we do, how do we kick American economy back into action? So without further ado, Daniel, you've written a nice and excellent article, The Way Forward Policy Proposals to Jumpstart America's Economy Now. Enlighten us. How should we do that? 
Sure, Z. Well, let me uh, let me begin by taking one step back and and just thinking about how we think about this entire situation. And one of the things that that I've seen everyone across the board, libertarians, conservatives, progressives, not getting completely right, is our mental model for thinking about what exactly is happening right now. And and it's difficult because this is a difficult kind of challenge than what we're used to. You think about previous challenges like. Uh, the September 11th attacks, that was an exogenous attack where we had a clear bad guy, uh, uh, someone who uh, intended to do us harm. Then you have things like the 2008-2009 banking and financial crisis. That was an endogenous problem uh, where, where uh, incentives were poor, people didn't set out to hurt anybody, um, but it was a different kind of problem. And what we're facing now is something where you've got an exogenous attack, but not by a bad guy. It's by some strands of RNA. And there's no one that we can take a fight to. So I think that the ability, the way that we have talked about this, either as a foreign attack uh, or as something that is, uh, requires government stimulus and aggregate demand management, has clouded the way that we're, we're thinking about this a little bit. Um, I'm glad to see that my, my co-panelists have been excited about the opportunities here to pull back unnecessary regulation uh, and to advance liberty on a bunch of different margins. Um, I think that that's one potential outcome of where we're going to see things, but I think that it's far from the guaranteed outcome. Um, we are likely to see some ratchet effects upward, some ratchet effects downward uh, in terms of the, the advance of individual liberty and economic and personal freedom. And I think it's too early to say which uh, way those are going to go. So you look, for instance, at, at some of the remarks that have been coming out of the uh, modern monetary theory crowd. They see this as an opportunity to advance their worldview pretty significantly, which is simply to say that monetary policy can be done by Congress uh, and we can make the money printer go brr as much as we want uh, and pay for uh, it, uh, any and all kinds of goods that are out there. And of course, all of this is poisoned to one degree or another uh, by tribal thinking. Uh, we see this with the way that, that um, the media is typically writing about everything through the lens of, is it good for Trump? Is it bad for Trump? What does it mean for the 2020 election? Um, th that is a really unhelpful way to think of things. And, and I think that for the most part, liberty-oriented groups being less politically tribal than progressive or conservative groups uh, have, have done a very good job of, of staying out of that. So now to your question about what is it that we can specifically actionably do here? There are a lot of real things that we can do. Uh, others on the panel have already touched on them, so I'll try not to go over them too much, um, but I break them uh, down into three different areas. The first, which we've covered a lot of, has been regulatory reform. Um, the most important thing when we're able to get the economy going again, and I know all of us as Hayekians detest this idea that we can push a pause button and an unpause button on the economy. Uh, this is the terrible uh, way that we're talking about it. So I'm just going to, to fall into that temptation. Uh, when we can unpause the economy, what are all of the regulations that uh, might be acceptable right now if costly to small businesses starting up again? Figure out this month what all of those things are going to be and, and clear them out of the way. I'll give two examples that haven't been mentioned so far. Uh, one of them is zoning codes, uh, which typically make it difficult to run a business from home. Well, I think all of us are running businesses from home to one degree or another right now. Is it allowed by our local zoning codes? Um, it's a good question. It's one we wanna figure out uh, before the licensing garage starts uh, knocking on our doors again. Um, what are ways to shift the burden of um, a presumption towards small businesses so that when they apply for a license, if that license is in fact necessary, it's deemed granted to them until uh, 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 local licensing authorities show that, that uh, it should uh, not be permitted to them because we don't have weeks and months to wait around to reopen restaurants and small businesses. Uh, states should continue more, more aggressively what they've been doing for the last couple of years anyway, changing their regulatory procedures, going through their entire regulatory codes and taking 15, 20, 25, even 40% of their regulations off the books altogether. And of course, occupational licensing is something that has come up. Um, we can probably get rid of half the occupational licenses out there uh, virtually overnight, uh, and it would be Pareto improving. Second area is on healthcare. A lot of uh, uh, good comments that have been made there already. One thing I'd add to that is rapidly expediting vaccines, not thinking about this as having a vaccine for COVID-19, but a series of different vaccines that are tried at different points. Once they've passed phase one safety tests, uh, then we do efficacy tests uh, actually in humans. Um, we can't wait around for three years until we get to a, a working vaccine. And then the third area is on fiscal policy. Uh, we've got our work cut out for us, um, shooting down bad ideas. Uh, we've already seen the idea that we're gonna have a $2 trillion infrastructure package, uh, along with uh, George Mason University's Garrett Jones. I've shown that, that uh, infrastructure stimulus uh, is likely to disappoint 
Uh, it will either provide you with little or no infrastructure or it will create actually few jobs. There will be calls for state pension bailouts, especially in places like New York and Illinois that are hard hit and already basically insolvent as states, not illiquid, but actually insolvent. And some good ideas that, that my colleagues and others have put out, uh, I'll just name a couple. One is um, uh, taking all of the funds that we're putting into unemployment insurance right now through traditional UI and through the CARES Act. Let's put those into private accounts and allow people to begin topping up their, their unemployment insurance accounts uh, and saving for a rainy day going forward. Uh, my colleague Kevin Erdman put out the idea of COVID HELOC accounts. We've got $19 trillion of capital tied up in our homes. Um, banks can and should be able to, if they hold the, the HELOCs on their books, uh, allow that capital to flow to people who are going to be restarting uh, or even growing their businesses. And the last thing I'd say, the plea that I think all of us should make to, to all of our governments on all levels is be honest with us. We're not children. This is, as, as Pete Becky pointed out, a massive coordination problem involving 330 million Americans. What we need is some kind of certainty, some kind of honesty about what is it that's going to happen next. And it's fine for public officials to say, we don't know. Um, but the worst thing that can happen is that we get a bunch of promises from the public sector and from bureaucrats that aren't fulfilled. I'll leave it there. Okay, uh, thank, thank you for this. Uh, let me just quickly say, uh, before we jump into Q&A, we have a ton of Q&A right here coming up. Just, let me just couple of, say a couple of things that I think uh, from a sort of fee perspective. So one, one thing is, uh, this is gonna be an, both a challenge and, a, and an opportunity. Uh, I think this generation will come out of this crisis, uh, justified or not, but they will think them, of themselves as a sort of a coronavirus generation. And many of the things they learn today are gonna be the things that shape their, shape their futures or how they, at least how they see the world. I think there are many studies that people who live through these kind of life events, they have a very a huge impact on, on, their, on their sort of future life. So my sort of question is, you know, or sort of the dilemma, not the dilemma, but the challenge we, we, we struggle with is, uh, not necessarily struggle, but the, basically the thing that we're doing is how do we make sure that we continue uh, promoting freedom and liberty even in these times? Because I think the question right here is very, or the dilemma here is very, very clear. Either young people are gonna come out of this thinking that uh, China is the best country ever because they locked up so many people and look what they did to the virus, uh, sort of coronavirus numbers. And that I think will definitely be the case. So that's all, therefore, this is why China is doing all these humanitarian missions to all these other countries to, to, to sort of share the equipment. So I think that's one possibility, which the one that I would much like to avoid. And then there's a second possibility. Maybe we can raise the new generation for whom role models is not China, but a Mercedes Formula One team that took 100 hours from idea to production of the lung ventilator. So basically private, private, private businesses in, uh, in the business of racing used the minds in a very Hayekian sense and created something that was needed very much. And they did that in 100 hours without government help, without government intervention, they just went and did that. So my hope is once we're done with these students, or due to these efforts and all of your efforts, these kids are gonna grow up more like uh, the Mercedes F1 team rather than a bunch of cheerleaders for the, for the Chinese regime. So that's, that's my hope. Uh, my other hope is that we can actually sway the discussion that many of these people that the left denounces as evil and rich business owners uh, are not that. My idea is to show that these people are suffering just like everyone else. And just because you don't wanna pay rent uh, to your landlord does not, make, does not give you any kind of moral right to do so just because uh, your landlord has a house and you don't. So I think that's another big challenge. I think the left will spend a lot of time trying to trying to paint all the business owners in some sort of negative light, regardless of what these business owners do. And I think it's up to us to show that these actually people, the business owners, just as, just as workers, are people who are struggling, who are trying hard to make the best of this, uh, of this bad situation. So we shall continue, she's continuing to do that. We do that through videos, we do that through our articles, and I think the coolest thing that we just turned around in a couple of weeks, just like that uh, Formula One team, is the Learning Center. So if you are a homeschooler, if you have kids at home, if you wanna perhaps exercise your brain and uh, try to think how would California's AB5 apply to Witcher uh, from Netflix, uh, you, can, you can go to our learning center and check out all these programs which are designed for, for homeschoolers and for teachers with kids who are now, uh, who are now stuck at home. 
So I think, I think we can call it the COVID-19 generation or the corona, coronavirus generation. And all of us, you guys, us guys, and uh, people who are listening here, we're all working to, to ensure that they come out of this sort of loving liberty as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to hating it. I think that's the challenge that we're all in here for. And that's an actual ex excellent challenge that I'm actually proud to, to have the opportunity to do so. Anyway, let's move on to questions. I think we have about 20 minutes for questions and I have uh, very many questions coming in through the phone. Okay, here, picked at random. So this is a question for Kent and Dan. If you were in charge of the country and the response to the coronavirus, uh, what would you have done to counter the crisis while still remaining committed to principles of liberty? Who, whoever of you want to take this first? I'm sorry, so what if we've done uh, the best? Yeah, well, the well, basically, so imagine you are in charge of a country, obviously United States, and uh, you are in charge of a response. Uh, what would you do to stay committed to both tackle the crisis and stay committed to the ideals of liberty? Okay. Um, uh, Dan, I think I'll step in front of you and I'll go quickly so that you can have the, uh, the cleanup on this one. Um, uh, a lot of what we've discussed, and, you know, political leadership is not just the operation and the management of government. Uh, if, if Dan and I had to step to the fore and co-lead uh, the government of the United States, I hope that we would be telling the truth to people and letting them know that the overwhelming majority of the good that is happening is coming through voluntary behavior. We're seeing this uh neighbor to neighbor we're seeing this within our communities we're seeing this across the country as people are stepping forward and saying i have a solution or i have a partial solution or i'm willing to try to offer a solution here for whatever whatever that narrow problem is and those things are coming right now the, the government is um, in the role of providing information and getting uh, other barriers out of the way and those are the things I'd like to see accelerated. Um, I do think there is a principled position to take that has to do with um, not stimulus spending, uh, which is not what we've seen, but with keeping the economy afloat. Uh, and so if you are going to prohibit people from engaging in activity, uh, it is not unprincipled to come up with a policy response that says, and therefore, these are the means by which you can uh, sustain your household. And, and that's, we've seen uh, imperfectly so far, but that's the sort of response that, uh, that I think has some merit. Okay, Dan? Yeah, I, I, I would uh, echo what Kent said. Um, the leadership that we're seeing here, the way that we typically see leadership in good times and bad times is, is coming from the bottom up. Uh, and I would, I would highlight that kind of uh, uh, leadership. Uh, and, and then the, the other thing I would add is you know, stressing the importance of uh, getting back uh, to normal and not having the negative ratchet effect. So for instance, if it's necessary for a brief period of time to you know, be taking people's temperatures when they enter public buildings or whatever it might be, that this not become the new normal. Um, we can't allow the, the kind of Robert Higgs crisis and Leviathan ratchet that we've seen so much, including significantly within the last couple of decades, uh, to become the new normal now. Okay. I had a question for Christina. Uh, so Christina, listen to this. How can we follow the principles of federalism and the 10th Amendment during times like these? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I'm, I'm really, really glad, in fact, to be asked that because so much focus right now has been on the federal level, right? Because this is a national crisis. It's frankly an international crisis. And so we're looking to the federal government to do everything. Um, and while there's a lot that the federal government can do in the way of getting out of the way, especially with healthcare regulations, there's so much that can be done and should be done at the state level. And I think that um, that, that preserving that balance is really, really important. So um, what I recommend that everybody in the Liberty Movement do, certainly the Goldwater Institute has been doing this, a lot of folks on this teleforum are, are doing this right now, is have specific solutions ready for your state legislatures to take up 
when they come back to their state houses, whether that be after temporary uh, recess or, or what's looking more and more likely um, later on this year or when they come next session. Everyone is looking for, you know, politicians want to do something, right? What can they do? The things that we discussed. Let's break down regulatory barriers and make it permanent. Let's um, get rid of all these restrictions that um, are making it difficult for people to be treated and that will and it will prepare us for the future uh, if and when something like this should happen again. Um, let's break down barriers to work. The Goldwater Institute has worked with um, partners across the country on this signature reform that was passed in Arizona and several other states that says, look, if you have a license to do your job in another state, you don't forget how to do that job just because, because you go into a new state, you get to take that license with you. Arizona has done this. It's already helped over a thousand people coming from other states just in six months to bring their licenses with them. Um, we talked about putting the presumption of liberty in licensing requirements. So, you know, ha passing state laws that say, look, um, if an agency is going to deny you the license to work or their ability to do your job, it has to prove there's some public health or safety reason for that. And if there's not, um, you get to do your job. Um, zoning and local, all, all the all these local uh, zoning issues that, that prevent people from working from home. This is going on now. You know, we see the removal of a lot of licensure, licensure and regulatory restrictions now, but we're still seeing local governments, cities telling people that they can't work from home. Just a couple weeks ago, a woman in Virginia, her business was shut down. She sold clothes online out of her house, didn't have anyone coming over her house. Um, her city told her that that was illegal because you can't operate a retail establishment out of your house. Uh, she's lost $30,000 already. I mean, this is crazy. Like we need there are state level reforms. Goldwater created something called the Home-Based Business Fairness Act that says, look, if you're not disturbing your residential neighborhood, then you have the presumptive right to be able to work from home, not just during a crisis, but always. That will jumpstart the economy. On and on, um, we, we've got at Goldwater uh, a litany of regulatory reforms that are ready for your state legislatures to take up. I encourage other groups. I know there's other groups out there that have those as well. Get those in your legislators' hands. Um, reach out to us if you need help, but let's educate people on specific policies that can be done at the state level because there is an absolute role for your state government to play. And it's about embracing and harnessing freedom and getting out of the way so that we can fix our country. I, I like that fighting spirit and those uh, that practical advice. Dan, question for you. Uh, how can we stray away from a Defense Production Act and let the markets be free? Uh, th that's a great question. So one of the things that I will actually say in favor of the Defense Production Act is that it allows uh, the federal government to uh, create markets, basically, where markets didn't exist. And so this is a way to address things like the chronic shortage of masks. We've got a, a couple of ways that we can do that right now. One of them is the, the beggar thy neighbor approach, which says that you cannot export anything that could be deemed medically necessary from the United States at the same time that we're trying to take, uh, take in anything that can be produced remotely. But another way to do that is for the federal government to commit to purchasing, say, a billion masks a month for the next 12 months at uh, a cost of, of $1 or $5 or, or, or something above the, the current market rate. That's a great way to, to stimulate supply and get necessary supplies out there uh, without um, the government trying to take over factories or trying to turn automobile manufacturers into ventilator manufacturers. That sends a, a credible commitment to the marketplace. It sends a signal that there is demand for all of this. If you're going to invest the kind of time and energy and retooling your business and training workers to create these things for the moment, that there will actually be an opportunity for you to, to uh, make up your fixed costs there. So that would be um, one thing that I would say in favor of it. Um, overall, though, throughout this entire crisis, the way that we have seen everything that has worked for the actual household level has been where the private sector has been brought to bear. I mean, how many of you have gone to the grocery store, had groceries delivered to you? Yeah, sure, there were a few shortages of things, but compare that to where the government has been trying to maintain federal stockpiles, it's night and day. In the course of this, I've seen three different uh, uh, UPS or, or Amazon trucks drive down the street in front of my house. Um, the private sector is out there, it's working, it's solving problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, Corey, question for you. A major problem with homeschooling is that an adult has to be at home. What kinds of solutions would you allow or propose for two worker households to homeschool? That's a practical question. Yeah, I answered a couple of these questions in, in, in typing form, and I linked to an article by Carrie McDonald, who's associated with the Foundation for Economic Education, 
But essentially, a couple of ways around this is that you can have homeschool co-ops where you get along with other families so that you can offset that time that you need to put forth and so that you can actually go to work. Uh, so that's one solution. And there's also things called hybrid homeschooling that you can look to, look into as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, then also with education savings accounts, this could offset some of the costs associated with homeschooling, some of the financial costs as well. I also want to jump in real quick. And one of the biggest things that I was seeing in the thread uh, as, a, as a pushback was that education savings accounts could come along with government regulations. And I've done research on this myself. I've done empirical studies finding that voucher programs that are highly regulated actually start to change the private schools over time if they're if it's a really highly regulated voucher program because then the private schools start to look like the government schools uh, but what's really good about education savings accounts it's it's much more difficult to regulate education savings accounts because the regulator doesn't know what's changing the difference in outcomes for students because as a parent i can spend that money on a private school tuition but i can also spend it on all these other different things and the regulator has a really hard time figuring out how to regulate esas so that's one response. And then also ESAs can be privately funded through tax credit uh, mechanisms as well, which those tend to be less regulated as well. And then finally, libertarians should all like this because these programs are voluntary. As a homeschool parent, I don't have to accept any government funding from the education savings account. But, you know, uh, we should allow all families to be able to make that decision for themselves. As a libertarian, I should be all for allowing every other family to make that individual decision weighing that cost and benefit um, themselves and I, I shouldn't impose my beliefs on, onto them. So I think this is a win-win for libertarians. And then especially when we're comparing the regulations in the government schools to the regulations in uh, education savings pro account programs, it's completely different ball game. Interesting question for Christina. And it goes like this. I have heard that the big reason for the relatively high healthcare costs in the US is due to the development of new drugs and treatments which are then exported to other countries which do not have to bear the cost of R&D. To what extent is this true or to what extent is, this the, is it the cause of expensive healthcare in the US? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's a complicated question. There's actually a great paper um, that the Goldwater Institute put out on this issue that I will link to um, after this broadcast that kind of goes through some of the reasons um, why we have high healthcare costs. Uh, especially in the U.S., and some of those are uh, related to R&D that is conducted here first. Um, there's good and bad to that. I mean, some of, you know, s there's there's trade-offs, right? Sometimes in a country that is relatively prosperous and that is innovative and that does have relatively low regulation and so therefore allows for the market to invent um, various uh, treatments and come up with healthcare solutions, you know, that does mean that we may be first in a lot of ways. And that does mean that we may bear the R&D costs, um, which, you know, we're always looking for ways to reduce regulation that's unnecessary so that we can reduce those R&D costs. But of course, the flip side is the fact that this, these treatments are available a lot of times here first, even if at a high cost, is a good thing um, because that means that we're able to get access to them earlier than we might otherwise. But what we need to be doing to make sure that those costs don't stay unnecessarily high is to allow for more innovation, is to, again, decrease needless regulations. You know, under the current FDA system, it can take 10, 15 years for a drug to go through um, the FDA clinical trial process. Now, there's important testing in that clinical trial process, but a lot of it is really just government drawing a line and saying, okay, when do we know that this drug is effective enough? Well, we never know, right? And no drug is going to be perfect for every patient and every disease at every time. Um, and frankly, no drug is even going to be perfectly safe. Tylenol, acetaminophen kills hundreds of people uh, a year. So, um, you know, we need to be careful about making sure that we're drawing, we know that there are these trade-offs and that the longer we require drugs to stay in testing, um, the longer, the more that's going to cost Americans um, and the more expensive it's going to be and the harder it's going to be to get those drugs. And that's really something that Right to Try uh, and other measures like that are, are really put into place to kind of counteract. Um, and the final thing I would say to that is, look, testing goes on in the U.S., testing and R&D goes on in other countries that have similar regulatory systems to ours. And that's why international reciprocity, sharing information is so important these days, as I mentioned earlier. Um, there are 
many versions of this. Goldwater's worked with Ted Cruz on a law called the Results Act um, that's out there right now. And essentially, the, the point of these laws is, look, information doesn't change from country to country when we have similar regulatory systems. Let's share that scientific information. Let's share that R&D um, so that we can reduce costs and speed uh, the approval of treatments and get them to people who need them. Okay. If I could just add one thing sure. to what Christina said, uh, safety and efficacy, we treat them as if they are binary variables. They are not. Um, they are things that exist on a continuum. And a lot of what we're going to be seeing, not just in, in drugs, but uh, in uh, public health interventions uh, in the economy, is going to be trying to get these safety and efficacy variables right. And that's going to require a lot of entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, it is not going to uh, be determined by more or less arbitrarily set thresholds that come out of a, a, a stagnant bureaucracy. Okay, and we have a final question, which is for Kent and me. And the question goes like this. Will these social distancing policies cause more loss of life through the resulting economic decline than they save from COVID-19? Can you speak on how to strike the balance? So Kent, want to go first or do you want me to jump first? Uh, I'll take a swing at it. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know that I have the most satisfactory answer because it's, it's one of those things where it really depends. Um, the near t what we can see now, the near-term analysis is is that social distancing and the uh, limits on individual freedom and mobility and uh, getting out and about, those are, those are all net positive, right? Economies in recession, even economies that, that shift into depression, um, you, death rates go down. Uh, death rates go up in certain categories like suicide, but they go down across the board. Uh, it is absolutely the case and we need to take the lesson that uh, daniel was just illustrating for us about the the two variables that had been discussed about efficacy and safety with it when it comes to drug protocols therapeutic protocols um, that is also the case with a wide array of questions that come before the policy making apparatus and the regulatory system is not suited to sorting out those balances the regulatory system is one that is rigid. It uh, lives in black and white. It's legalistic to the point of fault. And each of these sorts of characteristics makes it more and more difficult to find the balance that will be informed by local conditions, by local knowledge, by individual preference sets. And um, I, I think the reason that I started with, you know, saying it depends is the shape and nature of our public health situation three months from now is not known. And it's certainly not easy to predict. And that is the largest driver of the question about what sort of economic uh, uh, activity should be available to us. It is not the case that we're counting on and guaranteed uh, death totals in this nation of somewhere between 100,000 and a quarter million people. That's a that's a probabilistic, likely outcome. But uh, we might find ourselves four or six weeks down the road where that is uh, certainly no longer likely. Um, the larger question I think that is drawn out is on point. There are trade-offs here. And these are very, very uh, difficult trade-offs in part because so little information is at our fingertips. So we have to try to find uh, a way forward and a balance that allows for uh, as much economic activity as possible while keeping people uh, not actually interacting with each other on a person-to-person -person basis. And um, that's why we're going to see uh, a lot of policy adaptation along the lines of the discussion for the last hour, which is more choice and control in the hands of physicians and patients, more control in the hands of parents and heads of household, more uh, adaptability about where and when we do the work that we do in this society. Okay. Uh, pretty much stolen uh, words out of my mouth. That if I could add one thing, perhaps a silver lining to this very horrible calculus of what is worse or what is better, is that maybe this is one of the first times in many years when people actually started to realize or to bring back to the discussion that economy matters. 
uh, I just published an article today about how coronavirus and climate change policies are very much similar. And I think for the first time in many years, we see that people actually say, wait for it. If we shut down the economy, there's going to have real consequences and not just consequences in terms of how many cars I can afford, but people actually dying, people actually suffering. So in a weird way, I think maybe this crisis will bring, bring back some appreciation for economy. And perhaps with the biggest thing that keeps people from dying and in relatively good health is actually a well-functioning economy. It's, it's the wealth that economy creates. So I kind of feel optimistic that maybe we can reignite uh, or this crisis will reignite uh, the actual thinking that if we shut down the economy for any reason, be it coronavirus, global warming, particle pollution for anything, this is not a costless choice. It has a very costly choice, and that choice is the wealth of people, is people, people being fed, it's people being able to live their lives. And I think up to now, barely anyone, except for us, of course, on the right, have put up this argument before. And it is very easy to scream, uh, you know, planet before profits or planet not profits, when your fridge is stocked with, uh, I don't know, whatever, the stock hot dogs and any, all the other goodies. Um, my, th my feeling is that perhaps people after this will actually start realizing that economy also matters, and that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very important element of our lives. But at least, at least that's my hope. How it's gonna turn out, that's a whole, that's a whole different uh, animal. Well, just so happens that it's three o'clock and we wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, I'm very grateful for everyone who could have joined us today about how we can what the situation looks like, what we should do, and how perhaps these things will turn out later. I'm very happy and I'm very glad to say thank you to Mercatus Center, Reason, CEI, and Goldwater Institute. Thank you guys for joining us, and I hope we can have many of these uh, conversations again. Now, those of you who listened into this, we're going to send you an email recapping the main insights from today, providing contact information for the panelists if you want to get touch on them, and we're also going to be sending you a, a quick uh, questionnaire. Please, please, please answer that. Based on your answers, we can see if you know what topics we need to discuss in other town halls, uh, how many of these other meetings we have to have. So your insight is definitely going to drive our agenda uh, forward from, from now on when it comes to these kind of online meetings. So thank you everyone for joining this. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and let's hope this thing finishes soon. Thank you.